Chief Superintendent Reeford slumped down the stairs and entered the kitchen. Yawning freely, he filled the electric kettle with water and switched it on. God, he was tired. He had worked long hours because of this wretched fog business, and last night was the first he'd been able to take off. He went to the front door to collect the milk, eager for his first lungful of fresh morning air, something he always looked forward to. As he opened the door, he was already drawing in his breath. Before he saw the fog, his lungs were half full of it. Detective Inspector Barrow slept. He'd had a heavy week, and this had been his first break. He had gratefully sunk into his bed for once, unaccompanied by a girl. He had been too tired even for that. He had immediately gone into a deep sleep and still slept as the somber gray light filtered through the fog into his bedroom. Throughout London, people were waking to discover the yellow-gray fog surrounding their homes, some realizing its meaning, some not, many already too insane to care. Thousands had fled during the night, fortunate to have heard the warnings of the loudspeakers or the radio broadcasts, but it was a big city, and the thousands who had time to flee were a small proportion compared to the millions who received no warning at all. The huge beacons were lit, but the rolling fog swept right over them, rising from the heat and then immediately descending once it was cleared. Chapter 17 Homan steered the devastation vehicle cautiously out into the fog and away from the huge underground shelter. A man called Mason, gross and misshapen because of his protective clothing, sat beside him, peering through the small, lead-reinforced window, concentrating. It doesn't seem to be quite as thick as it was, said Homan. Oh, it's probably settled in a London basin, and now it's spreading out a bit, Mason replied. Homan nodded. It seemed logical. London was in a saucer-shaped bowl surrounded by hills. The fog would have drifted into it and come to rest at its base, then sprawled out, filling the tunnel. Its probable way out, unless there was a strong wind, was east along the Thames, through the flat country of Essex. Go left along the embankment, said Mason, checking the instruments on a panel before him. If we follow the road into the city, it'll take us towards it. Homan turned left, using the pavement as a guideline. He could just about see the opposite pavement now, something he hadn't been able to do earlier that morning as he'd made his way to the secret shelter. Even as he and Casey had been looking out of the fog, still in a state of shock and dismay, the telephone had begun its persistent, strident ringing. It had been Douglas Glynn, the Defence Undersecretary, and he had snapped out instructions not allowing Homan to argue or dissent. He was to make a car. The girl was to remain where she was. For now, it was too risky for both of them to make the journey across town. If anything happened to Homan, then they would find a way to reach her. The telephone went dead as soon as Homan said he understood and would carry out the instructions. He told Casey what was happening as he quickly dressed. He told her to bolt the door behind him and then lock herself in the bedroom. Then they kissed, and without another word, he left. The nightmare took on a new dimension once he was on his way to Westminster. He heard a car pass by, followed by a cold silence. He heard a scream, a woman's scream, and laugh. Then he heard another scream on his left, a long, piercing scream that ended in a sickening thud. Something wet brushed his face, and he put his hand to it. It was blood. Someone, a man, had jumped from a window, and their body had spattered blood for some distance as it broke on the concrete. His pace quickened. The longer it took him to reach Westminster, the more people there would be out on the streets, and it would become bedlam. He had to move faster. Dare he chance a car? He would be driving virtually blind, but it might be worth it. It wouldn't be too difficult to find one, and he knew how to start one without a key. He found his way to the curb and used it as a guide. He was bound to run into a parked car soon. He passed a woman who was pushing an ordinary house broom along the gutter, tut-tutting at the piled-up dirt and cursing at the world in general. He passed a dog feeding on the carcass of another. It looked up and growled menacingly, saliva and blood drooling from its jaws, not attacking, but watching him intently until he'd been swallowed up by the fog again. 
Then he saw the soft light ahead of him, which grew brighter as he approached. He thought it might be a fire at first, then perhaps a shop front because of its steady glare, but as he drew nearer, he realised its source. It gave him the answer. The way to get across London fast and with far less risk. Homan emerged from the underground station in Trafalgar Square just over one hour later, his hands and face black with dirt, a torch still glowing in his hand. The dark journey through the tunnels had been without incident. He paused for a moment to get his bearings, then hurried on. If his sense of direction was correct, Whitehall would be ahead of him, the Strand to the left and the Mall just off to the right. He was at the junction of all the roads. He thanked God aloud when he discovered he was in Whitehall. Finally, he found the turn-off he sought. Westminster Bridge was just ahead, and so were the religious freaks. They were seated on the ground in a wide circle, which he had unwittingly broken into. Welcome, brother! One of them who had been standing in the centre leading the chant spread his arms wide in greeting, then placed two huge hands on Homan's shoulders while the dirge coming from the others grew louder. The man leaned forward and whispered, If you try to run, I'll break your back. Homan was transfixed more by the harsh words than by the hold on him. To your knees, brother. Humble yourself so that you might be saved. Homan tried to resist, but more hands clasped his shoulders and forced him down. The big man's voice boomed out. I love you, brother. We love you. He grinned at Homan, and his hands closed on Homan's neck. In a desperate move, Homan went limp so that his body dropped then pushed forward. The momentum forced the leader to step back, thus tripping over the bowed head of one of his flock. Homan broke free of the grip around his throat, and he lashed out with his fist. With some satisfaction, he drew blood from the big man's nose. Then he turned and ran blindly away. He knew the bridge was nearby, and he prayed that the government vehicle would be there waiting for him. He kept going, trusting luck and his instinct for survival to pull him through, and then two bright circles lit up before him. Behind the circles, the shadowy shape of an odd-looking machine. He heard the roar of its engine, and suddenly it was coming towards him. It must be the one. It had to be. It stopped, and a small door at its side sprang open. A strange metallic voice said, Please get in, sir. We haven't got much time. Homan clambered into the vehicle and turned to face the heavily garbed male at the wheel, who said, I'm Mason, sir, and this vehicle. You'll find out why later. Now, let's get going. They drove slowly along the embankment, turning left into what appeared to be an underground car park. They went deeper and deeper below ground for at least a quarter of a mile. They stopped, and Homan made to get out. Oh, sit tight just a moment longer, sir, said Mason. We're being decontaminated. As a further precaution, they'll spray us as we get out. Spray us against what? The whole complex is sterile. There's not a germ down here. Everyone and everything that comes in is decontaminated. You see, it's built to contain at least 300 people for anything up to 10 years. If any bug got loose in such a confined space, well, it'd spread like wildfire. 10 years? Homan looked incredulously at the hooded figure. Just what the hell is this place? This, said Mason, is a government fallout shelter. They started building it in the early 1960s, and they're still adding to it. This is where the most important VIPs would come. There's a tunnel that leads directly to the Houses of Parliament, another one that leads to the palace. He changed the subject. Time to get out now, he said. Homan was led along more corridors by a young, unexcited man who explained exactly what had happened during the night and how it was now being coped with. The Prime Minister was there, together with most of the Cabinet. They'd been the first to be warned, along with the royal family, who were now safe in Scotland. The PM had decided to stay in London, in the shelter. The army was mustered just outside London, but most of the chiefs of staff were inside the shelter, helping to draw up a plan of campaign. Professor Riker was there, along with many other notable scientists, and so was Janet Halstead. They entered a large hall filled with people and with electronic equipment, brightly lit maps, television screens. They don't know, Homan thought as he looked around at the calm room. 
They don't know what it's like, a complete madness that would now have gripped the town. It was an unreal situation. How could minds possibly accept the fact of one of the world's largest cities gone mad? Only he could realize its full horror because he had seen it at first hand, had even experienced it. This way, Mr. Holman. The young man's voice cut through his thoughts. This is the planning room. The minister is waiting to brief you. As he guided the devastation vehicle along the fog-bound street, Mason beside him, Holman kept a wary eye out for groups of people. These would be the most dangerous, the ones that travelled in packs, like wolves searching for lone and defenceless victims. The fog doesn't seem to be as bad now, he commented. No, it's uh, spreading out, thinning, but it isn't moving on yet. We won't be out in it for long. Just time enough room for me to suction some of the bastard into our container, and then we'll be off. If I didn't need your eyes, I'd do it on my own, said Mason. Riker had been present at the briefing, and had assured Homan that the danger was getting worse, and that the quickest way to probe the mutation was still to obtain a large sample of it. He had every faith in Homan that this time he would succeed. Homan wished he had as much faith in himself. On his way back to the vehicle, he'd met Janet Halstead. She, too, had urged him to succeed this time. He had left her without saying a word. How could he promise to succeed? As they drove, they passed burning buildings, blazing cars, scores of people roaming the streets, insanity evident in their faces. They passed bodies that had obviously fallen or jumped from the surrounding tall buildings. They heard screams, laughter, chanting. They saw people on their knees, praying. They went down Fleet Street towards Ludgate Circus, steeling themselves against the sights, resisting the urge to stop and help people. Suddenly they found themselves surrounded by a mob of workmen at the bottom of Fleet Street. Homan and Mason heard heavy footsteps clanking overhead as some of the men scrambled up onto the roof. Christ, it must be all the bloody printers in Fleet Street, said Mason. Then the vehicle began to rock from side to side. They're trying to turn us over, shouted Homan above the noise. Drive, Mason commanded. The car leapt forward and ploughed through the thronging mass. Homan closed his mind from thoughts of his unfortunate victims and kept his foot down. At last they were clear and travelling up the hill towards St Paul's. Only then did Homan's hands begin to shake. Mason clasped a steadying hand on his shoulder and then reported their position back to the underground base and related some of the incidents they had run into. The voice that acknowledged their message said people were fleeing from the town in their thousands. The fog did seem to be thinning. It was thickest around the river. The voice promised to send any further information that would help them and wished them both good luck. Mason said to Homan, It all checks. We're going the right way. It's somewhere down by the docks. They passed fewer people as they drove through the city, but when they left its grey canyons behind them, they were faced with a spectacular scene. Jesus, said Mason slowly. Look at him. A bloody street orgy. Homan turned the vehicle and went up a narrow side street, then turned into another wider street to get them back on their original course. After 50 yards, he stopped the vehicle with a sudden jerk. A girl of no more than 15 was backed into a doorway. Her eyes were wide with terror, and her screams echoed. Advancing on her were two men. Their intent was obvious. She crouched in the doorway, whimpering. Oh, God, said Homan. He stabbed his foot down hard on the accelerator, and the vehicle leapt forward with a jolt. As it gathered speed, it mounted the curb and sped towards the two men, two wheels on the pavement, two wheels in the road. One man disappeared beneath the wheels, the other was tossed into the air to slam against the merciless concrete of a building. Their short screams and the longer, more shrill scream of the girl spun around Homan's head even when the sound had stopped. Without a word, he guided the vehicle back into the roadway to continue the journey. From time to time, Mason reported back to the underground base, coldly describing the scenes around them, the fires, the havoc, the waste of human life. 
Suddenly, a bus emerged from the fog like a huge red monster. Its front was spattered with bloodstains of the many victims it had struck down. It swerved towards them and struck their vehicle side on towards the rear. They felt themselves lifted violently as the vehicle was pushed into the air and then over onto its back. The grey world became suddenly black. For the second time that morning, Janet Halstead felt dizzy with tiredness, but she had to keep going. Countless lives depended on her. She realized Professor Riker and his team of scientists, microbiologists and virologists were close to the answer and wondered if it had really been necessary to send Homan out into the fog once again. But she supposed it was necessary. There was a chance he could save them valuable time, be it hours or days, and his life was expendable because of it. She tried to focus her attention on the report before her. The latest patient they had treated was responding immediately to the blood transfusion and the radiology. Fortunately, they had got to him in time. Others would not be so lucky. Yes, any time Homer could save was worth his life. McClellan and his family slept soundly. Outside his house, in the normally quiet Wimbledon Street where he lived, his neighbours were scratching at each other's eyes, tearing at each other's throats, far gone with the madness. McClellan was lucky, for they ignored the sign he had left on his doorstep, which said, Please help. Have given family overdose to keep from harm. Please help. They slept on. That morning, Chief Superintendent Reeford had climbed the stairs from the kitchen, carrying a kettle full of boiling water. He had stood over his wife and poured the contents of the kettle into her upturned open mouth. Her snoring had always sickened him. Then, as she had screamed and screamed, he had bundled her up in the bedclothes and locked her away in the cupboard. Soon now, he would let her out and show her the kitchen knife he held in his lap. Fascinating what you could do to a human face with a kitchen knife. You could make the lips smile permanently if you wanted to. He would show her when he let her out. He smiled at the cupboard door, listening to her moans. Detective Inspector Barrow had only just woken. He stood by the window, wearing a loose-fitting bathrobe, and gazed out at the fog. Abruptly, he turned away and walked towards the wardrobe. He took out his best suit and laid it carefully on the bed. Then he opened a drawer and took out a clean shirt, which he laid on top of the suit. He walked back to the wardrobe again and reached up into the high shelf inside and brought down his own private black museum of weapons used in various cases in which he had been involved. He studied its contents for a while and then removed one particular object. He replaced the lid and returned the box to its resting place. He went into the bathroom and shaved and washed. He dressed with some care, taking trouble over tying his tie. Then he shot himself. Chapter 18 Slowly, Homan opened his eyes and found himself in daylight, grey though it was. He could hear a strange voice speaking from a distance. Lifting his head slightly, he discovered he was lying in the road with the devastation vehicle on its back a few yards away from him. The voice coming from the open doorway to its cabin was the voice of the radio. This was demanding to know what... He tried to lift himself and found he could, although it made him feel a little giddy. Mason? Where was Mason? Homan's senses were returning rapidly now, and he sat up. Mason lay a foot away, his face turned towards him, the eyes unseeing, the expression rigid. All Homan felt was despair. Just as he got to his feet, a car appeared from nowhere, screeching to a halt in front of him. He ran round to the driver's door. He yanked it open and was about to haul its occupant out when the startled man said, Oh, please, please let me go. I've got to get away from these lunatics. Homan hesitated. The man behind the wheel appeared to be in his early forties. His eyes, although frightened, were not glazed. He said again, Please let me go. Get over. Homan commanded, pushing his way in. You're not the same as the rest, are you? The man asked nervously, as Homan put the car in gear. As the rest? Homan asked cautiously. You know, mad. Everyone's gone mad. It's the fog. Please, please tell me you're okay, like me. I'm sane, Homan said, wondering if he still was. 
Could anyone remain sane after all he'd been through? The man smiled. Well, thank God for that, he said. I thought I was the only one left. You've no idea what I've been through. My wife, my wife tried to kill me. It was horrible, horrible, he said brokenly. She picked up the bread knife, and I saw her bringing the knife down. I, uh, I, I was lucky. It caught my shoulder, and the blade snapped. We fought there over the breakfast things. She cracked her head, knocked herself out. I didn't know what to do. Then body began to shake. The man was reliving the horror. I tied her up. I was afraid of her, afraid of my own wife. She's always been so good, so gentle. Did you make sure your wife was securely tied before you left her? Asked Herman. Oh, I didn't leave her, the man replied. There she is, my Louise, behind you in the back. Herman quickly glanced over his shoulder. On the back seat was slumped the bound figure of a woman, recognizable as a woman only by her clothes, for the body ended in a bloody stump at the neck. Decapitated. A cry of horror escaped from Homan's lips, and he jammed his foot down hard on the brake pedal. The jolt threw the man forward, and Homan leaned across his back and shoved the door open. Still in one motion, he pushed the man out of the car and into the road. All he wanted was to get away, and he drove on. A black hole opened up ahead of him, and he suddenly found himself swallowed up by darkness. Once again, his foot hit the brakes. When he looked back, he saw grey light flowing in from a high square arch about up. Then he realised what had happened. He had driven a tunnel. Black wall tunnel, he said. To be. They'd been driving in that direction into the city through Aldgate down Commercial Road towards Poplar. Homan was in the old tunnel, the one used for access to the north. He would use it now and get to Westminster by following the river along its southern side. But he would have to get rid of the grotesque figure on the floor behind him. He got out and looked around in the back until he found the tied ankles. He pulled the body to the side of the tunnel, then straightened up and looked round. There seemed to be light coming from around a bend, but it couldn't be daylight. Before he drove any further into the tunnel, he would have to investigate. Cautiously, he began to walk down the tunnel towards the eerie light. It grew brighter at his approach, a strange, yellowish light. A familiar dread crept through him again. He began to suspect the source of the light. The acrid smell was growing stronger. Then he knew. The whole tunnel ahead was filled with the glow of the mutated mycoplasma. He had found it. Could it possibly have actually sought shelter like an animal searching for a lair? No, that was too ridiculous. And yet, he had found it lurking inside the cathedral, and they'd lost it once before. Could it really have drifted accidentally into these man-made shelters? He stood gazing into its hypnotic shine for several minutes and then backed away. By the time he got back to the car, an idea had formed in his mind. He jumped into the Ford and reversed it towards the entrance. Looking over his shoulder through the rear window, he saw a shadowy figure. It was the man he'd thrown from the car, and in his arms he cradled his dead wife. Chapter 19 Homan crouched in the dark shop, away from the eyes of the groups of lunatics roaming the streets, but positioned so that he could see the overturned devastation vehicle lying in the middle of the road. The fog seemed much clearer now, although the very air seemed to carry a yellow tinge to it. Homan had taken extreme care in driving back to the vehicle, for everything depended on his reaching the radio. He needed help from the base if he were to carry out his plan, and certain materials. His plan was simple. The mutated mycoplasma had been locked away below ground for many years, trapped by tons of earth. Now it had returned to another underground sanctuary, and this could be made into a prison if both ends were sealed. So he had returned to the vehicle, and with relief found the radio still buzzing, and he'd used it to tell headquarters of his plan. He asked for explosives as much as could be loaded into the second devastation vehicle, and also an explosives expert. He told them he was at a point along the East India Dock Road, close to a turning called Hale Street. He told them to hurry. Two hours went by before the other devastation vehicle appeared. He left his hiding place in the shop, and he walked over to the second vehicle, just as a heavy-suited figure clambered out. Well done, Mr. Holman said the voice, familiar, although distorted by the helmet's speaker. He recognized the slight German accent. Professor Riker, he asked. Yes, came the reply. I decided to see the mutation firsthand before we sealed it off. And I must have that sample, for we still do not know exactly what the mutation is. So please, let us go to this tunnel. We must not waste any more time. 
They climbed into the vehicle and sat down. This is Captain Peters, our explosives expert, said Riker, introducing them. Sir, the captain said to Herman, what happened to Mason? Herman pointed to two dead road. One of them is Mason. He was injured in the crash. This is Sergeant Stanton, the captain introduced a second man. Where are the explosives? Herman asked. The small cabin was fairly cramped with all four of them, especially with the other three's suits, making their bodies even more bulky. You're sitting on most of it, said the sergeant. Then the captain said, I think Mr. Homan should drive. He'll have a clearer view than any of us. We daren't take off these helmets now that the door is opened. Homan struggled into the driver's seat and the vehicle moved off. Of course, we still do not know if these suits are strong enough to resist to mycoplasma in its purest form, said Riker. And that is why it is still you, Mr. Holman, who will have to draw off the sample. Homan shuddered as he drove. Soon, by carefully skirting likely trouble spots, they arrived at the black entrances to the twin tunnels. Homan stopped the vehicle, and the four clambered out. Then Riker said in surprise, But there are two tunnels! Homan nodded. Yes, one is the old tunnel, the right-hand one, used by northbound traffic. The other, more recent one, is the south. The nucleus is in the old one. The four men walked into the entrance he indicated, three lumbering along, small oxygen tanks strapped to their backs, one unencumbered but looking humanly frail beside the others. Homan walked into the blackness for about six yards, then stood there, allowing his eyes to grow accustomed to the darkness. It's still there, he said after a while. The two soldiers returned to the vehicle and unloaded a lead container mounted on wheels from its side, similar to the one Homan had used in Winchester, only bigger. The sergeant unstrapped a long length of flexible steel tubing, narrower at one end. He coiled it over his shoulder and followed the captain, who was leading the motorized container back towards the tunnel's entrance. Riker said, There's no need to go too near the nucleus. You have 60 yards of steel tubing that is just stiff enough for you to push into the microplasma, and by switching on the machine it will be sucked back into the container. I will come with you myself. Take these with you, sir, the captain said, handing Homan a small oxygen tank and a torch. Homan slid the tank onto his shoulder. Switching on the torch, he took the arm of the mobile container in his other hand and said, I'm ready, Professor. They walked down the slope of the tunnel towards the bend. As they followed the curve of the tunnel, Homan said, You better stop here, Professor. The light's getting much stronger. I think the main body of the mycoplasma is just around the next bend. The light was dazzling as he reached the point of the bend. The sooner he completed this target away, the better he would like it. He placed the mouthpiece of the oxygen cylinder over his mouth, for the acrid smell was becoming stronger, and then he began sliding the steel tube along the tunnel into the glowing mass ahead. It met no resistance, a fact that surprised Homan. He'd almost expected some kind of resilience but he realized again it was an organism he was probing, millions of tiny microbes. He pressed the switch to start the suction unit, and the machine began to buzz and draw off the deadly mutation into its reinforced container. He was to leave it on for at least three minutes. It was a long three minutes before he switched off, pushed another button to seal the container, then detached the tubing. He stood up and looked into the radiance, perhaps should get a closer look at it. He was immune, after all. It couldn't harm him. He began to walk towards it. When he had only gone ten yards, Riker's gloved hand pulled him back. Homan could only stare at the darkened visor. You shouldn't be this close, Riker. Your suit may not be enough protection, he said. I know, I know, but you had to be stopped. Come along, let us get away from here. They collected the machine and made their way back to the tunnel's entrance. Everything okay, sir? inquired the captain, stepping forward to take the machine. Everything is fine, Riker told him. Now, take the container back out of harm's way. We will worry about loading it later. 
He looked at the arch of the tunnel and smiled inside his helmet. It is very fortunate that they thought of building another tunnel. Captain Peters and I will take explosives through the southbound passage and plant them at the other end. We must seal both openings at the same time so that the mycoplasma will be trapped. We will time our blasts so that they occur simultaneously. They went over to the vehicle and the sergeant began to unload the explosives. The captain returned. I put the container halfway up the incline, he said. It'll be quite safe there for now. Nobody can move it unless they know how to operate it. He handed Homan a small two-way radio. You take this, Mr. Homan, and you can speak to us while Sergeant Stanton is setting up his explosives, he said. It should take us about 20 minutes to get through the tunnel and set ourselves up, the captain went on. We'll radio through and synchronize our blasts that way. All set? He turned towards Riker, who nodded, and they clambered into the vehicle, which moved off down towards the second entrance. Homan stood well back while the sergeant set his explosives 30 feet inside the tunnel. The radio crackled in Homan's hand. Hello, can you hear me, Mr. Holman? It was Riker's voice, sounding distant. Homan acknowledged. The captain is inside the tunnel now, the voice went on. How are things at you? Went? Sergeant Stanton is just running out the fuse. We should be ready at any time. Good, good. Tell the sergeant that one charge is near the roof and another at the bottom of the opposite wall. Homan told Stanton it was now some distance away. He nodded and pointed at his chest. The sergeant's done the same, Homan said into the mouthpiece. Good, good. Now we must find cover. The radio went dead. Homan and Sergeant Stanton climbed the parapet and waited. The voice of Peters came on the air. Right, we'll give it a countdown of one minute, ready on the stroke of 60. Good luck, and keep your bloody heads down. The radio went again. Homan felt the whooshing of air before he heard the explosion, sweeping his hair back, dragging at his clothes. Then he heard a roar, muffled at first, then developing into a loud, rumbling crack of thunder. He expected to feel fragments of rubble descending upon them, but none came. Nice clean one, that, said the sergeant, looking towards the entrance. Homan managed to smile at what he saw. Broken rubble had completely filled the high entrance. He picked up the radio. Hello, Professor Riker, he said into it. <laughs> Quite a blast, hmm? <laughs> came the reply. Well, it's done the job at this end. How about your side? It's completely sealed at this end. Excellent, excellent. Then his voice broke off. There's a gap. Homan started with a sudden exclamation. Gott, there's a light. The hole is beginning to glow. The mycoplasma is escaping. I must get away from here. And the radio went dead. Homan, Homan, can you hear me? Homan made a grab for the radio. He had no idea of how much time it elapsed since the receiver had gone dead. This is Homan, he said hastily. Riker? No, this is Captain Peters. Professor Riker's beside me. I don't think he's too good. What happened? The mycoplasma got loose. It must have passed right over the professor. Homan said slowly, Is he all right? He seems sort of dazed. Be careful, Homan urged. He may have been infected. No, I think it's just shock. These suits are pretty bloody tough. Anyway, I'm following the thing. Then came an agonizing silence. Homan, there are two giant gas holders in front of us. The voice broke in again. Homan's mind raced back to the occasions he had used the three-lane motorway leading from the Black Wall Tunnel and the vast gas refinery beside the river. Holman! Holman, what is this place? It was Riker. Professor, are you okay? asked Holman. A little dizzy, but otherwise fine. Now, what is this place ahead? Holman told him all he knew of the huge gas works and how, if necessary, they could get into it. I think it is necessary, a voice came back. The nucleus is making straight for it. We are close to the holders now, and there is a gate ahead. We will go through. I can see the nucleus. It is nestled between the two gas holders like a, like a tiny child between two monstrous parents. He sounded almost whimsical. Then he went on. 
Do you know what town gas is, Mr. Holman? Well, let me tell you. It is a toxic mixture of hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and hydrocarbons. Furthermore, it contains ammonia, sulfur, hydrocyanic acid, benzene, and other substances. In other words, a highly combustible mixture. I think the mutation has provided us with another answer. Don't you agree, Mr. Holman? The radio went dead again. My God, thought Holman. He means to blow the tanks up and the mutated mycoplasma with them. But what sort of damage would an explosion of that force do? But he was right. It was worth the risk. Herman scrambled to his feet. He would cross the river through the tunnel that was still intact and help the two on the other side. He looked around for Sergeant Stanton and found the mob were at work. Fifty yards away, crazed people with grey-clad figure high into the air and letting it drop to the ground with bone thuds. They've got the sergeant. Homan was on his own again. He hurried into the tunnel that was still intact, praying that the crowd hadn't seen him. As he emerged from the other end, the radio crackled into life again. Captain Peters here, can you hear me? Homan here, he replied. What's happening? I've put as much explosive as I beneath each car. They'll crack like eggs. I'll set the timer for five minutes, which will give us time to get under cover. He went on. Here comes Riker now. I think he's still in a state of shock. One minute he's quite rational, the next he seems to go off into my... My God! Homan heard the captain calling out Professor Riker's name, then the radio went dead. After a minute or two, Captain Peters came through again. His words carried an edge of panic. He's, he's grabbed the detonator box, and he's, he's, he's walking back now into the fog, into the nucleus. Home and get into the tunnel if you can. I'm coming out. I'm beside the vehicle. I may just have a chance. Static. Then silence. Then two things happened at the same time. The mob poured from the tunnel below, carrying a blooded, naked carcass above their heads, and as he turned their way, a searing flash followed by a deadening explosion, and then in turn followed by a thunderous whoosh of exploding gas rocked the very earth. Homan curled up into a tight ball, trying to make himself as small as possible. He was afraid to look, for he knew the world above him was now a blazing inferno, and the heat would scorch his eyes. He was luckier than the people at the tunnel's exit. They were burnt to death instantly by the scorching blast of dry air. It was a long, long time before Herman had to uncover his head from his blistered hands and look. The whole area before him seemed to be a gigantic ball of flame, with sudden bursts of yellow flame among the deeper orange and red billowing fire. A few hundred yards away, he could see the shell of the devastation vehicle, almost completely burnt out now. He closed his aching eyes. The Sergeant, Peters, Professor Riker. What a terrible price to pay. He knew the mutation was gone, destroyed by the intense heat. The enemy and the ally of mankind but at the moment, all Homan wanted was to rest. A sudden rush of colder air stirred him from his apathy, and he looked again. As the fire rose into the air, the fog rose with it, soaring upwards with the flames. Homan sat back against the wall, his hands hanging loosely over his raised knees, staring into the sky, waiting for the first clear blue patch to appear. Herman had found his way back to the underground car park. He had told them of where the lead container with the sample was and of all that had happened, of the journey through the city, the death of Mason, the sealing off of the Black Wall Tunnel, the final destruction of the mycoplasma with the destruction of the gas plant. They had congratulated him, praised him but he had told them it was Professor Riker and Captain Peters who had finally destroyed 
the disease. When he had heard that the whole town was going to be sprayed with sleeping gas, he had begged Janet Halstead for a shot of something that would keep his fatigued body going so that he could reach Casey. They had promised him that the spraying operation would leave the area in which he lived till last, and they had given him the use of an army scout car. As he drove from the underground shelter, the drug was already beginning to revitalize his exhausted system. Even as he climbed the stairs to his flat, Homan could hear the low-flying aircraft in the distance spewing out their life-saving sleeping gas. First, the population of London would sleep. Then, blood transfusions would be given, followed by radiology to burn out the bad brain cells. Many were going to be all right again. The door to his flat was firmly closed. He pounded on it with his fist and he breathed a sigh of relief when Casey let him in. He pushed past her into the hall and kicked the door with the heel of his foot and then he pulled her to him fiercely. She broke away to look at him and her eyes instantly clouded with anxiety. John, what's happened to you? What have they done to you? she asked. a long story, he said wearily. But the worst is over for us now, darling, he told her, holding her close. When this is finally finished, when they've done all they can for those who've been harmed, the people are going to find out exactly how it happened. I'm going to make sure of that. But now, Casey, we're going to sleep. We're going to lie down together and drift into a long, long sleep. His arm round her, they walked towards his bedroom, his tired and aching body leaning on hers for support, and closed the door behind them. Overhead, Homan heard the hum of the low-flying aircraft and knew they had reached his sector. <laughs>